gravity. Wouldn't it be wonderful if it just wasn't there? Sometimes like when you're carrying groceries from the car or trying to run away from the bad guys and your only escape route is a walkway 30 meters above you. You know, these kinds of relatable everyday headaches that make us just wish we could flick a switch and get rid of gravity. Honestly, it's not something I thought about before, but okay. In many ways, gravity is like a bad relationship. It just keeps holding us down. Oh. Then as soon as we leave, we'd actually quite like it back because living without gravity is rather difficult. You can last several days without suffering withdrawal, but even spending a week in microgravity can cause changes in a person's physiology. Right now, that's a problem shared by the select few astronauts and billionaires that are able to make it into space. But humans are a species of explorers, and if there are places to be discovered, then we will sooner or later. Collar, I mean, I mean, I mean explore. <laughs> accidental Britishness there. Whether it's years or decades away, at some point humans are going to need a way to exist in space for long periods of time because the British just miss colonizing sh**. <laughs> so let's don our spacesuits and explore the science of artificial gravity. Since time immemorial, humans have questioned, and when humans questioned, we will stop at nothing to find the answers. And when Isaac Newton asked the now famous question, whose f***ing apple is this? He began a course of events that would result in him revolutionizing our understanding of gravity and forever making high school significantly worse for everybody. Before it was a scientifically dubious, very, very dubious film starring Sandra Bullock and George Clooney's voice, gravity was the weakest of the four fundamental interactions. Or in plain English, gravity is really weird. And the way we explain experience gravity here on Earth hides many of its true characteristics. And what are those characteristics, Simon? You probably didn't ask. Well, first is that gravity does not propagate throughout the universe instantaneously. It actually travels at the speed of light. Second is that it's not just the stars, planets, and your mother that can generate a gravitational pull. Literally everything generates gravity. Even singular atoms create their own infinitesimal amounts of gravity. It's only when they turn into planet-sized clumps about the size of your mother that the effect effects of gravity become noticeable to us. Third is that gravity doesn't stop ever. That's to say that gravity has an unlimited range. In other words, a single atom on one side of the universe could and likely does affect a tiny gravitational pull on an atom on the other side of the universe. And fourth is that when scientists describe gravity, they express it as an acceleration. The Earth's gravity at sea level, for example, is 9.81 meters per second. Meaning that if you were to graph the speed of an object falling through a vacuum at sea level, you would see that for every second that object was falling, its velocity would increase by 9.81 meters per second. So it could be considered like an addition of 9.81 meters per second every single second. So with all of that said, why are scientists still pissing about with lasers and large hadron colliders and not getting on with, you know, the useful sh it's like inventing gravity plates so that billionaires are not going to lose their bone mass in space. Focus on the important sh scientists. Well, the reason is actually fairly simple. I mean, it's simple if we stick with general relativity, which we absolutely will, because nobody has thought of an actual universally accepted theory of quantum gravity, and uh, we're not going to figure it out for you today. That's for tomorrow. So, from a general relativity perspective, gravity is not so much a property of matter as it is a consequence of being a piece of matter that exists exists in the universe. So as long as you have the property of mass, you will affect a distortion upon space-time that will result in gravitation. In order to create something that artificially generates an Earth-like gravity, you would need to build something that distorts space-time in an Earth-like way so as to create a similar strength of gravitational pull. Unfortunately, squeezing something with the mass of the Earth into something the size of a paving slab has the unfortunate consequence of said paving slab almost certainly collapsing into a black hole. Oh, Oh no! Of course, it's not as simple as that, but this is a short video, not a physics degree. Our apologies. Fortunately for us, though, there are several ways to generate something akin to gravity. But if you recall, we said that gravity acts like an acceleration. So you might be wondering, well, why not just get in a spaceship and use the engines to accelerate at 9.81 meters per second? Well, scientists have actually beat you to that. These are known as 1G ships, as in 1 times the force of gravity. As pointed out by Albert Einstein, from the perspective of an occupant of a 1G ship, uh, there would be no way of actually telling the difference 
difference between living in a 1G ship while accelerating and uh, living in this ship while it was stationary on Earth. Now, while we can theoretically make a 1G engine, there is unfortunately no known fuel abundant enough in the world to move a 1G ship any meaningful distance. At best, you could get 10 or 12 minutes of 1G travel before running out of whatever fuel you're taking with you. There are many theoretical fuels and propulsion system types that could work, however, but those require things like antimatter and exotic matter, which uh, we don't have yet in any practical way. Fortunately, there is a different kind of acceleration that doesn't require physics-breaking inventions to work. Angular acceleration, otherwise known as spinning. This is probably what most of you were imagining when we embarked on the question of artificial gravity today. As a feature of most space-based near-future sci-fi films, there isn't really any need to introduce the concept of a spinning space station. I'd get into the dynamics of why they work, but I aim to entertain with this concept, not give you a degree in engineering. A simple way to recognize the forces involved, though, would be to imagine a closed container half filled with water. Spinning the container will cause the water to begin climbing the walls as though it were being pulled away from the center. This is the premise of angular artificial gravity, and it works because pretty much everything in the universe likes to go in a straight line. If there was no wall in the way, the water would fly away in a line tangential to the center of rotation. As it is, a wall gets in the way and stops that from happening. So instead of our object flying outwards, it changes direction, and that requires an equal and opposite force perpendicular to the direction of motion, which is called centrifugal force, which also explains why we call it angular acceleration, because the object is constantly accelerating in a different angular direction. And looking at examples from science fiction, uh, we can get a feel for precisely how this effect works in practice. The space station from 2001 A Space Odyssey is thought to have had a radius of about 150 meters, an angular velocity of about one rotation per minute, which seems to do the trick in the movie, but doing some quick maths, we see that it would only generate about 16% of Earth's gravity. To get something similar to Earth, the station would need to rotate 2.4 times per minute. On the smaller end, the Odyssey space station for Interstellar was calculated to have a radius of 28.2 meters and a spin rate Rate of 0.59 radians per second, which pretty much means that it was spinning 5.6 times a minute, which produces exactly the acceleration required to create an Earth-like gravitational effect. So well done whoever came up with that on the movie. On the far larger side, we have something like the Elysium space station, which had a radius of 30 kilometers. Now, in the movie, the station appears to spin about one rotation per minute. However, some quick maths tells us that the gravity at that speed and size would be about 33 times that of Earth, which would have made the ending of that movie way funnier. I mean, they finally make it to the space station and the ship just gets absolutely crushed to shit. In reality, a station that size would only need to spin roughly every six and a half minutes to simulate Earth's gravity. So, guys, when we make things spin, people stick to the walls, or, well, technically, it would be the floor. But there are flaws associated with the solution, like the enormous cost, the requirement of as yet undiscovered materials, the difficulty of zero G construction, and all of the huge amounts of vomiting. You know, small things like that. But I mean, at the very least, we don't have to break physics in order to make the idea work, so let's run with it. As a Right now, the only known in situ experiment testing rotational gravity uh, was the Soviet Cosmos 782 satellite, which went up in 1975 and tested the effects of varying levels of artificial gravity on plants. Today, we would be able to build something significantly more advanced that may even be able to support human life, but we're yet to put in any considerable resources to doing so. The main reason that we haven't is because there just hasn't been a real need for such a station. It has proven significantly cheaper just to implement other methods of offsetting the effects of zero G into existing space stations like the ISS. But if we assume that at some point in the future we do find a need to build such a space station, well, what's it going to look like? Well, there's nobody has really been experimenting with this specific scenario. We can't say for certain. The closest we can get is research from the 1960s when the Soviet Union and the US were still doing the whole Cold War thing and spending tons and tons of money on loads of shit like this. From this research, two schools of thought emerged. One suggested that a rigid and perfectly circular habitat was the ideal choice. Let's call that option A. The other suggested that simply building two equally weighted modules connected by a tether was the better solution. Let's call that option B. While option A certainly is more aesthetically pleasing, not to mention offers significantly more available space, it would also be inordinately more expensive, not to mention at risk of serious failure. By having the habitat as one continuous ring, a single failure would purge the entire structure, basically killing everyone, whereas two separate modules would be able to sustain a catastrophic failure with only a 
a 50% mortality rate. So that's nice. On the more realistic side, option B offers significantly lower costs and fewer points of failure. The corresponding modules could be easily built on Earth and then launched into orbit with minimal construction required in space. In the near future, it's more likely that you'll see a tether space station than a perfectly circular one. But looking further away, you might be able to overcome the obstacles associated with building option A. But at this point in history, the idea that we can overcome these kinds of challenges ranges from entirely possible to completely off the wall batshit crazy. I'm not gonna lie, it just sounds like a lot of work to get all of that sorted. Thanks for watching.